Let us pray. O God, illumine your word today by your Holy Spirit. Let your good news radiate from the pages. Let your epiphany grace break into our hearts and our minds. Captivate all who hear these words that we might believe and obey. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Hear these words from Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, Jerusalem, Zion, praise your God. For he gives strength to the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He maintains the peace of your frontiers, gives you your fill of finest wheat. He sends his word to the earth. His command runs quickly. He spreads the snow like flax, strows hoarfrost like ashes, sends ice crystals like breadcrumbs, and who can withstand that cold? When he sends his word, it thaws him. When he makes his wind blow, the waters unstop. He reveals his word to Jacob, his statutes and judgments to Israel. For no other nation has he done this. No other has known his judgments. Now, most of you who know me know that I am not adverse to taking risks. I mean, first off, I drive on Interstate 40 in Winston-Salem every day, so that proves it, if nothing else. But I really am going to go out on a limb this morning, and I am going to take a risk that I normally don't take, realizing that for some of you, this message will strike particularly close to home. Most preachers hoping to be well-received, especially on the first Sunday in the year, usually find it wise to begin their sermons with something light and uplifting, positive, rather than depressing. But to broach this particular subject, it's probably best to get right to the bad news. And that bad news is that we are unlikely to ever find a generic cure for cancer. Let me say that again. We are unlikely to ever find a generic cure for cancer. Now, those are not my words. They are a statement that was made by science writer Mark Wolverton. He was summarizing what he had learned from talking with and studying with leading researchers in the field of oncology. Uh, Wolverton first reminds us that the trillions of cells within each of us regularly divide into new cells. But during that process, a mutated cell, an incorrect version of itself, can be formed. But he says cells usually just deal with it. The battle, however, is ongoing throughout our lives. And over the long run, the odds are against us every day. Beginning from the moment that you were a multicellular organism in your mother's womb, the cells of your body acquire new mutations. And just as in warfare, no defense is perfect. The longer you live, the more chances for a distorted, pernicious cell to elude your body's defenses and develop into full-blown cancer is increased. It's that reality that has led some researchers to what Wolverton calls the dark conclusion, that science is unlikely to find a generic cure for cancer. Let that sink in for just a minute. But, you know, even with the power that those words have, there is hope. You see, this realization has resulted not in a surrender to cancer, but rather to a change in the basic assumptions about how we intervene in the disease's progress. So significant is this change that Wolverton characterizes it as a paradigm shift. The evidence for this paradigm shift can be seen in the fact that Healthcare professionals, researchers, 
even cancer victims themselves no longer speak about somebody being cured of cancer, but rather they speak of them as being cancer survivors. This basic change of assumptions includes accepting the evolutionary nature of cancer, but then looking for treatments that work within that nature. Warburton says, if we give up the idea of a magic cancer-killing bullet, we can accept the dynamics that govern the disease while turning those very same mechanisms against it. We can shift research priorities from a model that is destined to fail to one that is more realistic, seeking targeted interventions, but avoiding the search for a chimerical cure. We can face this ancient scourge, however reluctantly, with a graceful recognition that it's simply part of what it means to be human. With that in mind, think about the words that we find in Psalm 142. This psalm was written most likely after the Jews returned from their captivity in Babylon. They came back to their homeland and it was, in, it was intended to convey to them that the same God who created the entire cosmos cares for them, these repatriated exiles. And among other blessings that the psalm promises, God, it says, grants them peace within their frontier. But what does that mean, really? Does it mean that Jerusalem is now some wonderful, uh, genuine community where everybody cooperates and everybody gets along, where there's a chicken in every pot and a Cadillac in every garage? Where there is no conflict and no discord and everybody is just happy as they can be and just tickled as a doodle bug? Well, not hardly. At least not in keeping with what we know from the Bible about that post-exilic period in the history of Judah. Still, although people there had the same kinds of problems that, ex- that uh, affect all humankind... There was the sort of peace that comes when threats are adequately addressed by a very powerful government. In this case, it was the Persian Empire, which intervened on Israel's behalf whenever there was a threat. But it wasn't the kind of peace that we expect in heaven. The Judeans understood that God was the power behind the empire's power, and Psalm 47 celebrates that. But that the resulting peace was once, was one where threats are not eliminated, but they are handled. And more importantly, if we are to allow this psalm to speak to us on a personal level, what does it really mean for us to have peace within the frontiers of our lives? Now, anybody that's been around the block a time or two, knows that problems and threats to our inner calm and our inner peace just keep on coming. They don't stop. Any peace in this life is not an eradication of unrest or an elimination of dilemmas and bad days. Those cancerous cells of turmoil and trouble continue to mutate and show themselves in, in ways that, that, that we don't even expect. Some of the time, probably most of the time, our natural defenses, including clear thinking and emotional buoyancy and helpful friends and spiritual faith, enable us to confront those problems and deal with the pain that we experience in this life. But you know as well as I do that that doesn't happen all the time. When problems grow like tumors, we need targeted interventions. To, if not cure them, at least enable us to have a life of confidence and resiliency despite them. God grants us peace within the frontiers of our lives. That's what the psalmist says, and we can hear that on a very personal, very intimate level. Now, the Hebrew word here that's translated as peace is 
the word shalom. Now, peace really isn't a literal translation of the word, but shalom does not mean the absence of conflict. Rather, it means a wholeness and having the things that we need in order to be happy. We can use shalom to denote the state of spiritual or psychological or emotional health that we'd like to have as as our default state. Now, no doubt over the years, you've heard lots of sermons about seeking God's help, taking your problems to God in prayer, counting on God to intervene in your favor, restoring your shalom. It's not my intention this morning to challenge that. God does come to our aid in direct ways that are answers to our prayers. And many Christians, even some of you who are sitting within the sound of my voice this morning, can give examples of that from your very own life. But the paradigm shift or the dark conclusion that I'm suggesting here comes from realizing that very often shalom is not some force outside of ourselves that God just plops into our laps. But rather it's a condition that God makes possible when we use targeted interventions against the threats of peace that arrive during the course of our lives. One such Intervention is just to reconsider what peace actually looks like. I mean, what are we really expecting of God? What do we expect out of ourselves, our friends, our family, the church? Another dark conclusion can emerge in how we define healing or resolution or inner peace. Sometimes when I'm visit with families who have someone who is terminally ill. And they say, you know, well, we prayed for healing. And I said, but you know, the Bible tells us that God always heals. Everybody wants to hear that. But then I say, but some of that healing takes place there and not here. That's not what we want to hear. Perhaps we should define what healing means, what resolution means, what inner peace really means. Very often we expect healing or answered prayer or success or a fulfilling life or whatever to look a certain way, to have certain particular characteristics, to meet a certain predefined set of criteria Criteria that we define. Real peace, true peace, comes when we just, when we just let go of defining the outcome and just let God give us what's in store for us. Somebody once described this as just getting out of the way and letting God be God. Peace can also come when we Listen to what's going on inside of us when bad days come. Now, I'm not one of those preachers who thinks that when we become Christian, we ought to check our brains at the door. I know there's a lot of folks that think that. But, you know, God gave us a brain. He gave us a marvelous ability to think, a tremendous intellect. And and as far as I'm concerned, that is a God-given gift. And he never meant us to give that up. But he has given us the spirit. So what he intends is that we use both of those together. Not in opposition to each other and not one over the other. God has given us the ability to think. And once we have identified what we are really experiencing on an emotional, spiritual, psychological level, then sometimes we can isolate the source of that discomfort. And that is an important way to move ahead into shalom. Taking the bull by the horns, looking your problem in the eye for what it really is and not for what you would, what you would like for it to be helps us determine whether we have a role in their formation and in their solution. People I counsel, 90% of the problems that people bring to me that they are experiencing in their, in their lives, the difficulties that they've encountered, guess who is responsible for them? Guess who is at the root? They are. 
through bad choices, bad behaviors. And if you are the one who is responsible for creating a problem, then maybe the answer lies within you. Some troubles, however, do come from outside of ourselves. They come unbidden. We didn't ask for them, but it just falls into our laps. But even in those cases, clarifying our inner experience helps us to decide what we're going to do next. Another targeted intervention, often in conjunction with identifying what we're experiencing, is to ask a trusted friend to share the burden. Not to carry the load but to partner in thinking it through. I was very fortunate in a former appointment. I had a parishioner who had, was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer, and we became, over the course of time, very close. And uh, he shared with me many of his experiences and feelings and just the things that he was able to, how he was dealing with, and, and we had that kind of relationship. That sharing the burden, I didn't carry it for him, but I shared it with him. Now, I'm not talking about having somebody that you can go and whine to about how awful, terrible, and horrible your life is. But rather about having someone to whom you can voice your dilemma, how, that you can speak the things that are on your heart. In Gaelic. There is a word for friend that is anam karij, which literally translated means the in me friend. Someone who is so close that it is almost as if you share the same soul. You see, this is the kind of relationship in which meaningful sharing can take place and bring peace within the borders of our lives. It's instructive that the word peace is very often paired with the word love. Preacher and author Frederick Buckner, for example, has noted that Jesus, for Jesus, peace seems to have meant not the absence of struggle, but rather the presence of love. That friend that listens to our trouble is in reality loving us. And that contributes to the restoration of shalom. Still another intervention, one that we are very often shy to take advantage of, is to seek advice from the last possible person in the world that you would ever turn to. Somebody that you don't agree with. Sometimes a person like that can give you a perspective that you never had before. Give you, well, to coin a phrase, a new set of eyes. Likewise, you can do something else that you may not usually do. You can involve yourself in an age-old task of journaling. In the early Christian church, many of the church fathers journaled their, their, their walk, their faith, and they talked about the difficulties and the encounters that they had throughout their lives. Okay, these are, these are just examples of unconventional ways of seeking peace. There, there are others, no doubt. But the point is, God sometimes works that way in ways that very often use our limitations as resources. In that regard, we should note what Malcolm Gladwell pointed out in his recent book entitled David and Goliath, which is based on a shift in how we think about accomplishment. He argues that underdogs often have more success than expected because their limitations force them to be creative. If David, who was a whole lot smaller and a whole lot weaker than Goliath, had confronted that great big old giant with a spear and a sword and a shield, it's not unlikely that Goliath would have just flat out ate his sack line. But you see, David turned that disadvantage into an advantage. He used what he was good at, and that was slingshot. Gladwell refers to that Bible story in his book and then goes on to tell of all the people 
who are at disadvantages who turn their limitations into qualities, like a guy who had dyslexia, who compensated by developing skills like observation and memory. Later, he was able to exploit those as a lawyer in a courtroom. Such creative applications of weaknesses are, in fact, what we call targeted intervention. Rabbi David Wolp, who is a brain cancer survivor, shares this particular insight. He said, throughout my various illnesses, I prayed. My prayer was not answered because I lived. My prayer was answered because I felt better able to cope with my sickness. Every time I go in for my regular tests, the CT, the PET scans, the MRI, Each time I am moved into the metal tube that will give me an image of my sickness or health, I pray. I do not pray because I believe God will give me a clear scan. I pray because I am not alone. And from gratitude that having been near death, I am still in life. I don't pray for magic but for closeness, not for miracles, but for love. The novelist George Meredith said it best, who rises from his prayer, a better man has had his prayer answered. God gives those who trust in him. Peace within their frontiers. Peace within the frontiers of their life. Not usually as some kind of an automatic grant or cancer killing bullet, but sometimes by just helping us come to the dark conclusion. Or by leading us to discover a targeted intervention to deal with those things that would seem to make our peace impossible. And when we realize that, we can face, however reluctantly, those things in our life that disrupt us. And we can do that with a graceful recognition that is just, that's just part of what it means to be human under God's care. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, all around us we see the scars of sin, violence, illness, poverty, want, degradation. This is not as you intended our world or us to be. It's not what you created us to be, not what you created us for. We are grieved and we're sorry for the mess that we've made and we acknowledge our inability to change it on our own. We throw ourselves upon your mercy, grateful that you haven't abandoned us to our own devices. You are ever-present, coaxing reconciliation out of hatred, whispering peace in the midst of war, nurturing hope from the seeds of despair and creating new life out of dead ends and failures. Renew us by your grace to be useful instruments in your hands for your eternal purposes. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.